So Bradley, since there are plenty of people here who you know, know your name, but maybe don't know your backstory, tell us a little bit about you know, where you came from. Sure. So um, unlike probably almost all of you, I come out of the dirty world of government and politics. Um, the Bloomberg world, which is a little less sleazy than most politics, but then I, so I worked for my couple of times in City Hall when he was mayor, and then I ran as a campaign in 2009. But then to counterbalance that out, I also spent four years in Illinois, which is as sleazy as it gets. I was the deputy governor, worked for a guy that you've all heard of, because he's now spending 14 years in jail named Ron Bogoyevich. Um, <laughs> spent a couple of years on the Hill as Chuck Schumer's communications director, so there's that joke, the most dangerous place in Washington is being, being Chuck Schumer with a TV camera. I tell you, that's true. Um, got trained with police a couple of times. Um, and... Uh, so I've been doing government politics for a long time, and then the Bloomberg campaign started a consulting firm that runs big multi-jurisdictional campaigns for big companies. So say you're Expedia, and the hotel industry is trying to pass new taxes on online travel booking in 12 states, we'll figure out what's the strategy, build teams on the ground, run like a political campaign, and then kind of accidentally fell into your world in 2011. I get a phone call saying, hey, there's a guy with a small transportation startup, he's having some regulatory problems, can you talk to him? Um, so, uh, become Uber's first consultant that day. I get really lucky when Travis calls back and says, I can't afford your fee, would you consider taking equity? Thank God I said yes. Um, spent the next five years beating the shit out of the taxi industry uh, all over the U.S. So, when you guys travel and you can get an Uber, uh, it's because we waged war on these guys everywhere. Um, and then uh, we had a particularly vicious fight in New York. The mayor tried to put a cap on our growth in 2015. and. We ran a really aggressive campaign, kind of disproved that adage that you can't fight City Hall. We won, and I use that as an opportunity to launch a business that works with lots of pre-IPO companies and in regulated industries. So whether it's FanDuel or Handy or Old School or Ease or Lemonade or Uber or whoever it is, uh, I think we're in 23 different companies right now, typically Series A and B, uh, dealing with political, regulatory, media problems all over the U.S., so city state. That's great. That was a lot of information. But um, you do so much. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's really intriguing. So let's back up for a second. You decided to start your first business. You've got five businesses, or maybe I'm, is that four or five yeah, businesses? That's right, yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting that after uh, Bloomberg's campaign, you decided to, to, to go into business for yourself. Why was the timing right? And also, what did you learn from Mike Bloomberg that you are replicating? And maybe what did you observe that you are not doing? Yeah, so uh, the, the timing was right because I had uh, one non-political job, not completely political, uh, before I started my, my first company. And uh, I was at Lehman Brothers, right, when they took down the entire global economy. I had went there to build and run a business within it to privatize state lotteries. And what I learned is it's really boring, at least for me, to work at a really big bank. And so I was probably the only person in the building who was kind of relieved when they filed for bankruptcy. Thank <laughs> God, I get out of here. Um, and Mike decides to run for a third term, so that, you know, the running campaign, that works out. And, you know, I, I knew that the skill set that I had was really devising and running campaigns. And because my work had taken me all over the country, I knew that I could do it in lots of places. And those two things were a little different from what anyone else in that market was doing. Um, and so that's what kind of caused me to say, I'm going to launch this. And it's part because Mike's a generous man, as people know. He gave me a a bonus at the end of the campaign, and it was, remember, to, with the amount left after taxes, it was all the money I had. My wife, like, when this gets down to like 50 grand, I gotta get a job. And luckily, uh, it didn't come to it. But I think the thing for Mike the most is his culture, right? So, you know, our business in some ways is just a little microcosm of, of kind of Bloomberg, right? Where we're all in a bullpen and totally you know, a very flat hierarchy and total transparency, and we try to just treat people really well and pay people really well and assume that we're going to get great talent and it's going to pay off. And that's really, if you look at almost all of his businesses and, and as mayor, his real skill set is he just attracts talent. He knows how to recruit them, how to support them, how to give them the confidence they need to take risks. Um, and that's what makes him so successful. Um, another thing I think is very interesting about your business is your business is the only one I know of. Um, it's because you're so high profile. And I think a lot of the other reporters in the room, too, when we're dealing with issues now of, you know, startups uh, wrestling with these regulatory issues, we all think, let's call Bob Bradley. Why did you decide to take such a high-profile approach? You're not the only one doing this. There's another firm, Global Strategy Group, that works with uh, 
Uber and uh, I'm sorry, not Uber, Facebook and Airbnb. Yeah. Well, explain the thinking there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a few things. One is, you know, because luckily Travis said, hey, we should take some of the fee and equity. I, I hit this point that gave me some, at least on paper, some real independence. So let me say I can do whatever I want, um, and really enjoy that nexus of tech and politics. And felt like there weren't a lot of people who were in position to work with startups to protect them from kind of the entrenched interests that would like to see them go out of business. And so that's why we chose to do this kind of work is because it's interesting and it can be meaningful. Um, and the profile is in, in some ways, you know, in politics, I already had a reputation. So when I built my consulting firm, I didn't really need to do a lot of press, but you know, deal flow is, is the lifeblood of any VC and that's good for us too. And in some ways, uh, because it wasn't like I came up through this world at all, uh, would have to be a way to say, hey, here's who we are, here's what we do. If you've got a really interesting company and a really big problem, we're willing to take it on and we're willing to do it for equity and really be part of your team. And But it, it took kind of being out there enough for people to realize it. And keep in mind that for years and years, the default view out here was, oh, you know, those regulators, when they see how smart I am, they'll do whatever I want. And I think people finally get the best talk at all how politics works. But there's still a little bit of that to so the more and more that I think you know, people see that there's a resource to help them think through these problems, you know, the more useful this are. Right, right, absolutely. Um, actually, I'm wondering, given your sort of success and the mind share you have now among startups, are there other, like, more traditional firms sort of thinking to get into your... Uh, I, hope, I hope not. Um, <laughs> I, it's a challenge in the sense that, one, you know, we're able to do all of it for equity. Um, obviously, I, I paid my people in real dollars. Uh, um, so there's a lot of financial risk that you have to be willing to take. I, I'm willing to do that and able to do that, but I think that that's a challenge uh, for some people. And also, typically, if you're someone like me and you're five years into your kind of political consulting firm, you sell it to these big coding companies, WPP or Omnicom, and they never let you do something like this, right? And I never want to work for somebody else. It's another lesson I learned from my Bloomberg. Uh, and so the freedom to do that, I think, is, is um, you know, pretty unusual. So uh, I like to think there's some barriers to entry to replicate our model, but I'm sure some of them come along. Um, you know, it has been said that, or people have speculated that maybe you're interested in a public position yourself, or that's a, you're, yeah. you're interested in all this. Yes. Uh, um, no, I mean, look, the only job to me that's worth having uh, is being mayor of New York City. Um, it's a great job. Uh, I did launch a super PAC about a year ago to get rid of our current mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, just because I think we deserve better than a mayor who's under seven separate federal corruption investigations and comes to work at 11 a.m. and doesn't work on Fridays and doesn't care about substance. How do you really feel about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's different than saying I, I want the job. Uh, also, look, I'm an independent. Uh, I guess another thing I got from Mike Bloomberg. And kind of like in San Francisco, New York City, um, if you're not a Democrat, it's exceptional. Um, I also, I, this is a little feel, but you are, I don't know if you can even talk about this, but you're raising a fund as well. So you're talking about equity and paying your guys, but there's going to be another component it, to this. this is, uh, I guess I could say that it is not getting in trouble, but I think I get into trouble with the lawyers if I get into more detail. Okay. So okay. stay tuned. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I did want to talk about startups, and I know we only have so much time, but uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, just because I think your um, take on politics is always interesting. You've said that Hillary, Camp Hillary Clinton was a flawed candidate, um, and actually um, my husband would agree with you on that, but I sort of wonder if it was that she was a flawed candidate or she ran a flawed campaign. Because she, could, she did come within like a percentage point of you know, the popular vote that Barack Obama uh, managed. So. Yeah, I, I actually think it's the former. So if you look at their campaign, uh, let's say you did a front analysis of their campaign. Can you find mistakes? Sure, they clearly didn't spend enough time campaigning in the Rust Belt. But, but other than not going to Wisconsin, there's not a lot people can point back at and say, that was the tactical mistake you made that made you lose the election. The fundamental problem is uh, the voters just couldn't connect with her. They didn't really trust her. And of all the different possibilities, she just she might have been the vote most qualified and perhaps the best president of the options, but she just wasn't the best nominee. And I think that that's what it was about. In fact, if you look at this campaign, you know, part of the answer is money didn't really matter all that much, right? She vastly outweighs Trump, but because the her media was so so comprehensive and saturated with everything, people didn't really need to see an ad to know how they felt. Right. Um, so I, I think it was in this case much more of a candidate than the campaign. Well, speaking of fundraising, um, I'm, I'm uh, interviewing uh, Naval Ravikant, who you may know, uh, he co-founded uh, AngelList, which is this uh, oh, yeah, crowdfunding sure. platform. But um, he's said something interesting. Um, 
last fall, which was that he thought, even before the, the, the election result had come in, that this is the end of the elite candidate. That because of crowdfunding, you know, we saw how much money Bernie Sanders raised. Um, and uh, because of social media, you know, we saw how much people were listening to what they're reading on Facebook versus what they're reading in the New York Times. Uh, that things are forever changed. Do you think that that's true? I don't know. I, mean, I think that ultimately it all comes down to your ability to connect with voters. And you can be, I mean, if you look at our three presidents before this one, Obama, Bush, and Clinton all went to Harvard and Yale constantly, right? So they're pretty elite. But they all, in their own ways, had you know, some authenticity that really worked for voters. And they all not only won, but they all won twice. Um, and so Donald Trump grew up a really rich guy who, as he tells us every day, went to work. So he's not exactly not elite either. I think that you always have to be able to connect directly with voters. I mean, the difference is there used to be this filter called like the traditional mainstream media that now has very little impact. Um, and isn't necessarily even playing the same law. I'm kind of obsessed with this notion that the New York Times has fundamentally changed their business model and made a decision consciously or subconsciously to say, look, we are better off kind of being a digital and print version than MSNBC and just being nakedly partisan. And we think that will both win us better customers and therefore more advertising. And we think that's our moral imperative. And it may or may not be the right decision to make, but it's a radical shift to have sort of a global paper of record for 130 years, whatever it is, completely change their MO in a matter of months. So, uh, you know, so it's, in some ways, just if the candidates may not be that different, it's the, really the media and, and, and the vehicles that are different. Well, and the rest of the world, too. I mean, I've never seen the tech community come out, you know, obviously such full force <laughs> against the candidate. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, well, one other thing that you also that I thought was interesting um, was, and we, and we saw a glimpse of this um, last, was it last week when Trump uh, staged that sort of reality TV like moment announcing the Supreme Court nominee? But he was saying, it sounds so extreme, but he was like, you know, basically there's going to be more and more transparency in the office. It doesn't feel like that right now, but, um, you know, we could get to a point where the, the president's actually wearing a camera at all times, recording everything, and even though we, um, you know, sensitive discussions aren't going to be maybe uh, released for years afterward, the people will be able to see them. Can you see a day when that happens, or does that sound completely... Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that this particular president, I mean, in some ways, he's the most negatively transparent president possible, and in some ways, he's very traditional and antithetical to, uh, to transparency and, and innovation. So, hard to say, but I do think overall, you know, you could argue that because we are so much less of a civil and polite society, things that might have moved along further that are harmful from a policy perspective will be objected to um, and litigated a lot faster now, right? You know, it didn't. The amount of time from when he signed the executive order of immigration until protests and rallies and lawsuits was really small, right? right? Which is sort of a, an incredible shift in the way that society functions. So, in some ways, that, that's a good defense uh, if you have a leader who, who you don't like. Um, but, you know, we'll see. But I think that's the, the, the more likely evolution. Okay, I would better get moving. But um, if you had to get behind a candidate right now, I wonder if there's anyone who you would sort of put out there? Yeah, well, so, talking about the president 2020. I would really like to not see it be a U.S. senator, right? So there's this already kind of emerging cabal of Joe Brand, Booker, Warren, uh, you know, Warner, maybe Cuomo, a couple of governors like Cuomo, Ramondo, who I like a lot, but still, um, you know, look, when, when Mike was thinking running for president um, last year, I made the case internally that Cheryl Sandberg should be our VP. Uh, he wants some of national security experience. He picked Adam Mullen, and I don't really she would have taken it anyway. But I felt like she was, you know, the kind of person who could really connect with voters in a way that would, would complement sort of my skill set. So I still think she would be great. Um, what about what about Cheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg together? You know, yeah, yeah, I mean, it'd be an interesting ticket. Um, I don't, I don't know who would head the ticket. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, there's this, this talk of Tom Hanks. Maybe he'd be good. We have had an actor president once already, so who knows? Oh, really? um, you know, Howard Schultz. I think plays footsie with running for office a lot, but um, but I think one of the things that Trump proved is, you know, you know, I always talk to people who say, well, I want to run for city council. Why? Because I want to be a congressman. Why? I want to be a senator. These days, I think rather than kind of working away up the political ladder, you're much better off just saying, here's the job I want, and running for it as an outsider. Um, so I don't know that, I, my guess is the strongest candidate the Democrats will have in 2020 will not be a politician. Um, and that's the best shot of taking on Trump. So interesting. Okay, let's talk quickly, I don't have a whole lot of time, but 
Tom's Task Task Ventures, you mentioned it has 23 clients. Yep. Um, now, my understanding is that you've got you have somebody who works on like a couple of co companies at a time, yep. sort of publishing a daily email newsletter, staying on top of the issues. Yeah, we run things like a campaign, okay. right? So the idea is there's an objective business needs. So take Handy as an example, right? What Handy needs is to have. Okay, so do you want to talk about what Handy is? Handy, Handy is a platform that does housekeeping and and different types of around the house fix and stuff. Um, they are leading a coalition of a bunch of different sharing economy companies to create a new form of broker classification. It's between 1099 and W2. This is important because for them to get the kind of talent that they need, they don't want to turn into a traditional W2 business, but they do want to provide people with benefits, with health care, workers' comp, disability, and they think that will help them attract and retain the best possible talent so that people want to use their service. Um, we're working both on the federal level and state level in multiple states to try to create uh, legislation that would create this new form of worker classification. Um, but typically speaking, we pick a very specific, tangible business goal and then run a really aggressive political campaign to achieve it. And one of the ways we do that is just sort of send an email where every day every portfolio company gets an email from us saying, here's everything happening, every jurisdiction, every issue, everything going on. And we just try to apply that level of intensity and sophistication um, because that's how things get done. And uh, one thing that you've done with great success is mobilize the user bases of some of your clients, like Uber and uh, uh, FanDuel. Yeah, FanDuel's for example. So, um, you know, literally making it easy for them to click on something and, and bomb their you know, local representatives. What do you do in cases when, the, when that's not possible? Yeah. I'm interviewing a company coming up that I think is fascinating. I hope you guys will agree. Um, Royven, uh, which is a bio pharmaceutical holding company, so its clients are... Well, so in, in Royman's case, and they're, they're one of ours, so I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, look, they're making drugs that can help people with really horrible diseases like Alzheimer's. So I think there is a constituency that you can passionately mobilize. Um, but you're right. O overall, there needs to be that juxtaposition. So I think of the first time for Uber that we ran this big grassroots campaign. It was in D.C. in 2012. Mm -hmm. and. You know, anyone who's been in a cab in D.C. knows that like, it's like, one of the worst cab cities in America. And all of a sudden, there was legislation to, to wipe out Uber in D.C. And we were able to go to our customers and say, if you want to continue using the service, we need you to reach out to your city council member. And over 100,000 people did in the span of a week. And they weren't formulators. They were unique, organic emails. Mm -hmm. um, so there's got to be that passion, right? If you work for FanDuel, not in the same numbers, because obviously it's, it's a smaller base. Mm -hmm. But people who love fantasy sports really love it. Right, and they really don't want to see it go away. Um, and so, look, sometimes you have that passion and you really harness it, and sometimes if you don't, you're running more of an insight. Uh, you know, just yeah, in any given campaign, the first thing to figure out there's always a political decision maker, and whatever goes further their ambition or heightens their insecurity is what you want to play on to get to where you want to go. Right? If you learn one thing today, keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> And then ultimately, if, if you can do that by inundating them with emails and tweets, and they say, holy shit, I, I don't care that much about fantasy sports, I'm just going to let this thing pass, great. Uh, if you can't, and you got to hire a bunch of lobbyists or beat them up or something else, that's what you do. And it, it not only varies by company, but it varies by jurisdiction, by fight. You know, people always say to me, do I beg for forgiveness or ask for permission? And so it's like, well, it depends, right? Like, who are you begging for forgiveness from? You know, when it was with Uber and it's on some taxi regulator, and, if we get fined 100 bucks because we have the wrong license plate, that's one thing. If you're asking a U.S. attorney for forgiveness, you're looking at three to five. Like, that's a different issue, right? So, you know, I, I think it's just all these things require a certain amount of nuance. Right. Okay, we're almost out of time, and I know everybody here wants to go through some issues, so like, let's do a speed round. Contractors versus employees, which you just brought up, is this top of mind for the administration? Um, it's top of mind for the speaker. So I know, I know for, for, for a fact that Paul Ryan and his office care a lot about this issue. Um, I think, you know, there are senators like Rubio that, that engage on this in the campaign, too. I don't think the White House is any real awareness of this one way or the other. Self-driving cars and trucks. Uber tried to roll out, you yeah. know, in the most progressive city, San Francisco. Got but that's down. why, I mean, if you think about it, so the politics of autonomous are fascinating. We could have done a whole session just on that. Um, but they're local, right? So in Pittsburgh, Bill Peduto's entire political future is based on a guy who transformed Pittsburgh from a rust belt manufacturing city to a knowledge so therefore, the optics of autonomous Ubers is like amazing for him, right? Whereas here in San Francisco, I'm going to generalize, you people don't vote in municipal elections, and therefore your voice is irrelevant in municipal elections. Um, and people who do vote in municipal elections don't like that, right? 
So therefore, for Ed Lee or your supervisor, like Aaron Peskin, it's green politics to go after, yeah. you know, with tech companies, right? So a lot of it really still comes back to like, what does the individual office holder need and care about? What are the inputs? And that'll help you figure out what the outputs are. Yeah. Vote in the elections, guys, locally here. Is it something like 15% of people vote in May? That's so t typically, yes. Yeah, so, uh, municipal primaries have typically under 20% turnout. Okay, two more quick questions and then we gotta go. Uh, the Affordable Care Act. I mean, obviously it's not getting gone in a flash. What should healthcare startups be doing right now? I mean, I, I have two things. One is if you believe that your model will be significantly improved by whatever Washington does eventually pass, then you gotta get in the game, right? And you gotta have good lobbies to see any good strategy for that. Two is, you know, it seems to me there's a likely scenario where they throw a lot into the states and the states decide that will create chaos, but that also means there's opportunity, right? I think you look at it and say, okay, here's our states where we think they may like our model. Let's get in there now and start working them. So when they make decisions on Medicaid funding, for example, or insurance mandates, um, our position is front and center. So, you know, I, I don't think anyone really knows what the ACA is going to look like, but I think that if you're not thinking about it and saying, here's what I want federal and state legislation and mandates to look like, and trying to shape it, then you're doing yourself a disservice. And last question, I don't know what we do about this with immigration ban. I mean, you know, the Ninth Circuit seemed to come pretty well yesterday, so hopefully that'll hold up. But, you know, there's there's the broader, there's the executive order, there's broader immigration policy, there's the wall on the H-1B visas. Um, I think on the H-1B visas, the trick is to sort of work with the Republican Congress to reject it. Um, you know, you can do a lot of counter executive orders, and this president so far seems to be trying, as far as he can. Um, but most of the big stuff has to happen legislatively. And so I think everyone is sort of spending so much emotional energy on Trump. But like, don't forget about Ryan and McConnell and all those people because you know they can be a pretty good bulwark against stupid stuff, and they can help you pass some good stuff. And there are be issues where you're not going to agree with them on social policy. There's you know a lot that I wouldn't agree with them on. But um, you know lumping all Republicans together as bad or evil is a really short-sighted approach, and it's a good way to feel morally superior and then lose. Good advice. Thank you so much, Bradley. Thanks for having me.